My father, Seraphim Rose, had a profound and still processing uh, and continuing impact on my life. So what I want to do here is read from the first chapter, the preface, the introduction, share some pics in the, the first chapter of this kind of a biography of his life uh, with the idea in mind of kind of sampling the soil where such a um, amazing human being was grown. You know, he was born and raised in right outside Hollywood, California in the 50s and 60s. Um, and his life is absolutely fascinating. So these first few parts are going to be, uh, you know, just a giving a context and then a background of his family, his grandparents on both sides, his parents, their temperament, the way it was growing up in the home, uh, what Eugene, his name, uh, his name is Eugene Rose. So Father Sarah from Rose, what his interests were in high school, what he was like as a child. Um, these will be the uh, topics covered in these first sections. So I hope that um, you guys enjoy it. Thanks. Father Seraphim Rose, His Life and Works. This is a picture of Father Seraphim lecturing at the St. Herman Summer Pilgrimage in 1980. This book was copyright 2003-2010. First edition was September 2003. Second edition 2005. And this book is the third edition, which was released in February 2010. Uh, the front cover... Here is Father Seraphim at uh, St. Herman of Alaska Monastery, Platina, California. It was in 1979. And this from the back cover is Father Seraphim atop Mount Yola, Bali, October 11th, 1981. This was uh, the year before his repose. Um, so we'll get started. The first page is uh, this quote from John 18, 33 to 37. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. This is a picture of Father Seraphim at St. Elias Skeet on Noble Ridge with the top of uh, Mount St. Herman in the background. St. Herman of Alaska Monastery, Platina, California. We'll get right started here into the preface. A quote from Mark to start off. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. Starting into the text, the preface. Not long after the untimely death of Aramonk Seraphim in 1982, Archbishop Anthony of Western America in San Francisco, Russian Orthodox Church Abroad, observed that Father Seraphim had been the first American podvesnik uh, or righteous struggler, a specific group or type of uh, or righteousness in the Orthodox Christian tradition of sanctity. Undoubtedly, Archbishop Anthony had in mind St. Paul, who said that those who truly follow Christ must put to death their members which are upon the earth, having put off the old man with his deeds and having put on the new, which is rewarded after the image of him who created him. Colossians 3. 5, 9 through 10. This biography is the record, the true story of how an American convert to Orthodoxy became a Podvisnik. There have been others or righteous strugglers in North America, most notably 
St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, Father Seraphim's own mentor, and St. Herman of Alaska, the patron saint of this continent. But Father Seraphim was the first American-born Podvisnik. I don't know if I'm saying that right. As such, he is both a clear example and a gentle shower of the way for American Orthodox. In one of his homilies, St. John Chrysostom said that, quote, a good example is better than a thousand sermons, end quote. And the blessed Greek elder Gabriel of the Anaisu, who reposed after a year after Father Seraphim wrote that, quote, holiness of life is the best kind of preaching, end quote. Although he is justly famous for his books, articles, short but pithy sermons, and learned lectures, those who knew Father Seraphim personally were primarily influenced by the example of his righteous struggle to come closer to Christ, which culminated ultimately in genuine holiness of life. Thus, Father Seraphim's patient lifelong struggle is itself the most important sermon or lecture he ever gave. This is why this present biography by Haramonk Damascene is so important. When I was in Russia in 1998, I met some ardent young Russian men and women in St. Petersburg who had read Father Seraphim's book uh, and, tra and translation. In translation, they asked me to share my own memories of Father Seraphim. I spoke to them about personal details, such as what his sermons were like, how served, how he served the divine liturgy, how his monastic cell was arranged, his personal appearance, what his speaking and chanting voice was like, and so forth. When I finished, there was a long pause. Then one of them observed, quote, You know Father Seraphim is really for us young Russians. End quote. Surprised, I said, That's funny. I always thought that he was for us Americans. And then I realized this is one of the signs of a saint, that he appeals to everyone, everywhere, in all languages and cultures, with an immediacy and conviction not to be found among this world's celebrities. Quote, unquote, celebrities. Truly, in the years since his repose, Father Seraphim has, by God's grace, emerged from the quiet, almost hidden, but extremely productive Platina years, and became now a shooting star, no longer a steady small flame burning on a mountaintop in Northern California, but now part of the fiery firmament of heaven itself. This biography is the story of how that happened. That was from uh, Ermonk Ambrose, formerly Father Alexi Young, Hermitage of the Holy Cross, Wayne, West Virginia, 2003. Introduction. Father Seraphim Rose is an American known and loved today all over Russia. Anyone in Russia who knows anything about his ancestral faith, Orthodox Christianity, knows Father Seraphim's name. His books, The People There Say, Changes Lives. Change Lives. An American Orthodox convert who spent several months in Russia has written, quote, When I would meet Russians, invariably, after finding out I'm an American, they would excitedly ask, Did you know Father Seraphim Rose? It's a startling fact that almost everyone knows of him, even the children. They consider Father Seraphim, his writings, and, his witness of, and the witness of his life in Christ to be pivotal to the resurrection of Holy Russia in our days, end quote. During the era when their religion was being mocked and undermined by an atheist state, Father Seraphim spoke openly to people in Russia against the spirit of international godlessness, making them unashamed of their ancient faith, giving them strength and courage to continue struggling. He spoke to their hearts and souls in a way that made sense out of their long decades of persecution, suffering, and purification. Thirty years ago, Father Seraphim's work reached Russia from America, where translated and were clandestinely distributed in typewritten manuscripts from one end of Russia to the other. Later, with the advent of freedom in Russia, they began to be published there openly in mass quantities in books and magazines, and began to be talked about on television and radio. His books have been made available everywhere, even on book tables in the metro, the subway, and in kiosks on the street. This, thus, just as Russia once brought the fullness of truth, orthodoxy to America, now so America, through Father Seraphim, is bringing that truth back whence it came. In the orthodox countries, especially those formerly dominated by communism, Father Seraphim is also widely loved, his works published and studied, and his name held in great reverence. 
His works have been published in Greek, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Georgian, Latvian, Polish, Italian, French, German, Chinese, and uh, Malayalam, or South, South Indian. Who was this man who, although known to only a small segment of people in the affluent, pluralistic West, has made such a tremendous impression on suffering Eastern Orthodox lands? Who was this penetrating spiritual philosopher who appears to have emerged out of some ancient patrikon? Who was this desert-dwelling monk whose name in Russia became surrounded with legends about his remote life in the wilderness? The answer is that this man who came to be called Father Seraphim Rose was basically a simple, straightforward, and above all honest American. He was raised in sunny Southern California, a few hundred miles from Hollywood and Disneyland, by parents who knew next to nothing of Eastern Orthodoxy. His mother only wanted him to be successful. His father only wanted him to be happy. The story of Father Seraphim Rose is not just the story of one individual. It is the story of what can occur in the conscience of the American soul when God stirs there the cords of righteousness. Father Seraphim's basic honesty enabled him to pierce the darkness of his times, not only for his fellow countrymen, but for those in far-off enslaved lands as well. At an early age, he rebelled against the superficiality of modern American society, against this worldliness, materialism, light-mindedness, and boring rationalism. As part of his rebellion, he partook in the restlessness, despair, nihilism, and moral anarchy of the angry young men of his generation, the progressive intellectuals, bohemians, and beatniks. His forthright, self-sacrificing character, however, pulled him out of this self-indulgent and forbidden escapes that his peers were making. Even the ideas and practices of Buddhism, which were just becoming popular in the West at the time, left his soul empty and yearning. It was then that God revealed himself to Father Seraphim's sorrowing soul and the conversion from modern American rebellion to ancient apostolic orthodoxy was begun. When he did come to the Orthodox Church, he cut through all the externals and went right into the essence and heart of otherworldly Christianity. He, was, he has blazed the path for other honest, forthright, worldly, uh, he, he has blazed the path for other honest, forthright American souls to follow as they too heed God's call to righteousness. But there was another aspect of Father Seraphim, one that especially endeared him to the hearts of Orthodox Christians behind the Iron Curtain. As his monastic co-laborer of many years observed, observed quote, Father Seraphim was a man who knew how to suffer, end quote. He knew the value of redemptive suffering, sought manifested in the Christian martyrs and confessors of his own time, and consciously embraced it, not only outwardly through the hardships of his wilderness monastic, wild, monastic life, but also inwardly in the pain of heart that characterizes true Christian love. He found the truth, and he had suffered for the lack of it. Now, having found it, he suffered for the sake of it. The author of these lines was a spiritual son of Father Seraphim, having been returned to the love of Jesus Christ through him. My initial impressions of him were, first of all, that he was the wisest man I had ever met, and secondly, that he was, he was as one dead, a man who had died to himself and to everything in this world because he had set his sights on the kingdom above. I was in awe of him. During my subsequent visits to his monastery and my talks with him, I gradually came to know more deeply the one who, the one who lived within him. But I did not know him. I did not know the story of how he became the man he is. It was only after his repose that I learned of his former life, of the darkness from which he had emerged. And I was even more in awe of Christ, who had transformed him into a new being, and of Father Seraphim himself, who had allowed his old self to be put to death so completely, and, along with the Ap Apostle Paul, had been dying daily. I saw that not only had my first impression of him been true, but that it had only scratched the surface of a profound mystery which the world can never comprehend, the recreation of a soul through the grace of Jesus Christ. As I stood beside Father Seraphim's coffin in his simple monastery church, beholding the radiant heavenly image of his face in repose, I shed tears of gratitude, thanking him for giving me the truth, the pearl of great price for which it is worth selling everything that is in the world. Today, now that nearly three decades have passed since his repose, I, 
I see the tremendous potential of what he accomplished to his all too brief life of 48 years. Mine is only one of, mil of the millions of lives that, has his, that his has deeply touched. I feel compelled to make his message known, to give back to others what he has given me. Through him, modern America brings forth out of its own soil a harvest of ancient mystical Christianity. It is a depth of Christianity that America has yet scarcely knows, hidden from all earthly tumult and vanity and partaking of the otherworldly kingdom of God. That was from Hermonk Damascene, St. Herman of Alaska Monastery in Platina, California. Part 1. Here is Father Seraphim during the New Vellum Theological Academy course in 1980. Beginnings, chapter 1. Quote from Euripides, This man is not a well-born member of a famous house. He's one of many, yet he's a true nobleman. Father Seraphim Rose, who has been called the first American-born link to the mind of the ancient Holy Fathers, was born into a typical white Protestant middle-class family in a typical California coastal city, San Diego. The name given him at birth was Eugene, which means well-born or noble. Eugene's parents were second-generation immigrants to the United States. Both of his mother's parents came from Norway. John Christian Holbeck, his grandfather, arrived with his family when he was 13. Hilma Hellickson, his grandmother, though born in Norway, was actually Swedish. She was brought to America at age three. The Holbecks and the Hellickson's settled in small town of Two Harbors, Minnesota, where John and Hilma grew up, met, and were married in 1896. John worked as a driller in a diamond mine and then tried his hand at farming. He and Hilma had five children. Their third child, Esther, born in 1901, was Eugene's mother. Esther was raised on a 40-acre farm that her father had bought at $10 an acre. It was poor land, stump land, she used to call it, and she remembered her father using dynamite to get rid of the stumps. John had to augment the income of his growing family by working a night shift in town. Later, he had cows and peddled milk from house to house. The Holbecks and their children baptized and raised them in the Lutheran church. Great emphasis was placed on education. They sent the old, oldest son, Jack, to college at great financial sacrifice, and he repaid them after he became established financially. Although only two of Holbeck's children were able to attend college, nearly all their, children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren earned at least one college degree. As a matter of pride, everyone was expected to be successful. John Holbrook was the epitome of the sober, hard-working immigrant. His daunting task of hewing out a living from the land left no room for pastimes. Once, when his daughter Esther returned from a walk in, in the woods, singing and carrying flowers, he immediately looked on this in terms of its practical value. Quote, you can't eat music or flowers, end quote, he told her in his heavy Norwegian brogue. Later in life, Esther did take time to pursue music and to paint mostly flowers, but the experience of growing up in such a hard-working family gave her a no-nonsense practicality that never left her. She was always concerned with the financial side of things. The man she married, Frank Rose, was of a different stamp, a humble, quiet, agreeable sort of fellow. He was one to take what comes in life. Frank was a French and Dutch, of, uh, was of French and Dutch stock. On his father's side, he had, a French, he had a French ancestor who had been a soldier in Napoleon's army and had married a Hungarian gypsy. If there was any passionate gypsy blood in the Rose lineage, however, it certainly skipped a generation in the person of Frank. Frank's father, uh, Louis Desart Rose, had emigrated from France to Canada and then to the United States, and he opened in an ice cream parlor and candy store in Two Harbors. He had a wooden leg, the result of a train accident as a young man. Quote, no one pitied him for this or even talked about it, recalls a family member. It was just something that happened and life went on, End quote. Although from a Roman Catholic background, Lewis was a confirmed atheist with sympathies towards socialism. He claimed to have read the New Testament before the age of 12, the impressiveness of this claim evidently being intended to lend weight to his atheism. Lewis' views on religion, however, did not prevent him from marrying a devout Dutch Roman Catholic, Mary Vandenboom, whose family had settled in Marquette, Michigan. 
Louis and May had four sons. One of them drowned at the age of 12. Frank, their second child, was born in 1890. According to his mother's wishes, he served as a Catholic altar boy for several years. May died at the age of 48, when Frank was only 14, but he continued serving in the church for four more years. Frank Rose fought for his country in the army during World War I, going to France and returning home as a sergeant. He met Esther Holbuck when she was working at his father's shop, Rose's candy store. She was 11 years younger than he and had just graduated from high school. In 1921, they were married, with, uh, married in two harbors. Frank tried his hand at the candy and ice cream business, even opening his own store after his father's had closed down. Later, he worked for General Motors, during which time his first child, Eileen, was born. In 1924, when Eileen was two years old, Frank and Esther moved to Southern California, away from the bitter Minnesota winters. In San Diego, they opened another candy store, a franchise caramel, ca caramel corn shop, which did good business only when the Navy fleet came into town. They eventually had to close it, and Frank got a steady job as a janitor for the San Diego Park and Recreation Department. His work consisted mostly of taking care of the sports stadium. Two more children were born to the Rose family in San Diego, Franklin Jr., who was born four years after Eileen, and Eugene, who was born another eight years later. All three of the Rose's children were intelligent, good-looking, and above average in height. Eugene Dennis Rose was born on August 13, 1934. This was during the depth of the Depression. The Roses had bought stocks and lost them, and at times they had scarcely enough to eat. Although Eugene was probably at, at, at probably too young to remember this period, Eileen recalls the family standing in bread lines. Quote, when there is hardship because of lack of money, she said, this is something that is not easily forgotten. Success, success becomes equated with monetary reward, end quote. Esther, already inculcated with the values of hard work and thrift, now became frugal in the extreme. She remained this way throughout her life, even after Eileen and Franklin Jr. were on their own and the family was comfortable financially. She never gave up her practice, learned during the Depression of saving silvers, slivers of soap from the household sinks and then boiling them down to make new soap cakes. All of her children were raised with a no-frills attitude toward life. Frank Rose was already in his mid-40s when Eugene was born. Because he was so much younger than his brother and sister, Eugene was raised essentially as an only child. When he was born, his parents called him their extra dividend. When Eugene was only four years old, his sister Eileen, then 16, graduated from high school and left to go to business college in Los Angeles. Two years later, she married and in subsequent years saw her younger brother only infrequently. Before she left home, she would take care of Eugene at home when her parents were working at the caramel corn shop. Quote, I remember him as a happy, lovable child, she later said. Eugene's surviving grandparents moved to San Diego after his parents did. Luis Rose died and when Eugene was only seven years old, but John and Hilma Holbach lived until he was full grown. In later years, he was given a family heirloom, a grandfather clock, which had been... Uh, given to Luis and May Rose as a wedding present. To the end of his life, Eugene treasured this clock as a link to family tradition and continued the custom of winding it every day, every night, long after it stopped telling the correct time. Here are a couple pictures of Eugene at one and a half and Eugene with a bunny at Easter. Continuing here, Esther, having a decisive, strong-willed personality, was the unchallenged ruler of the Rose household. She had to be on top of all that was happening. Nothing was hidden from her, and to make sure of this, she dug through her children's drawers and read their letters and papers. A strict disciplinarian, she was very demanding of her children, expected them to be perfect, and seldom, if ever, accorded praise. She was from a generation of parents who felt that it was not good to comp compliment children too much, lest they be come conceited. But although she would not praise them to their faces, she would, she would rave about them to her friends and relatives when they were not present. Above all, she would brag about Eugene. Quote, we are not a demonstrative family, Eileen calls. Even Frank, although he was a very warm and loving man, was embarrassed to display affection. Eileen says that he never kissed her while she was growing up. Quote, mother was tough when crossed, Eileen says, and father kept out of harm's way, end quote. 
It seems that Frank had little choice but to be dominated. When Esther expressed her strong opinions, which was not infrequently, Frank listened attentively and generally responded with naught but silence and a smile. He scrupulously avoided conflicts and usually expressed assent by saying, Betcha. He rarely, if ever, harbored bitterness or ill will toward anyone. Like his father, Eugene responded to his mother's will without complaint. From his father's example, he learned to listen attentively but silently to mother. She set the standard for the family, and Eugene did his best to live up to it. He was remembered in the family as the perfect son, the proverbial dutiful child. If there was a favorite child, Eileen recalls it was Eugene, because he was always tried hard to do what was expected and did not cross mother. Quote, Eugene was a joy, Esther said later years. His father thought the sun rose on him, end quote. According to his wife, Frank was, quote, satisfied with a little bit. His interest was to be at home with me. He was happy just to be at home and take care of the yard. He was a contented man, having no need for outside interests. He always took a lesser job and never told Eugene what to be in life or pushed him to make money, end quote. Frank was not a practical man, Esther affirmed. He was the intelligentsia, and I was the practical one. Compared with Esther, Frank was an avid reader, going through two newspapers a day and faithfully keeping abreast with the magazines U.S. News and World Report, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal. He did not, however, read many books. Frank's docility, together with Esther's strong-willed personality, made it inevitable that the natural order of the family would be reserved, reversed, in the Rose home. This was the only truly unfortunate factor in Eugene's upbringing. Yet in all fairness, it must be said that Frank was not simply a doormat. If one looked hard enough, one could see hidden strength in him. He displayed, he displayed that shy, dogged integrity, that deeply loving nature which is emphasized to express itself characteristic of the common man who, so the populist books express itself, characteristic of the co uh, and movies of the period claimed, who could become a hero if placed in the right circumstances. In his later years, there would even be times, although few and far between, when he would stand up to his wife or at least express disagreement with her, especially when he felt this was needed for the sake of his son Eugene. Eugene would one day remember the, these rare incidents with gratitude. Like all boys, Eugene looked up to his father. Like many, he took from him his best qualities. Growing up, Eugene emulated his father's practice of never exalting himself. He too, at least when it came to worldly honor and material things, was, quote, satisfied with a little bit, end quote. Above all, he showed forth his father's quiet integrity. Here's some pictures uh, on top of the Rose family. Uh, from left to right, you got Frank. Franklin Jr., Eileen, Esther, and Eugene. And then again on the bottom there, you have Eugene, quote-unquote, only child with his mother and father. From his mother, Eugene acquired a down-to-earth practicality, a touch of stubbornness, and a clear, con concise, lively language which often made use of folksy words and phrases and yet was spoken with perfect articulation. And from both parents, he acquired old-time American honesty, integrity, and straightforwardness, which later enabled him to see through various forms of hypocrisy. All these parental influences, both the good and the bad, were not lost on Eugene. Like everyone else, he was a product of his family and social environment, together with innate qualities. But into the midst of his family setting, another unpredictable element was ushered in. It was as if, into an average American family, a true nobleman had been born. In some ways, Eugene was absolutely different from the rest of his family, although during his boyhood and adolescence, this difference was not nearly as apparent as it was later on. At first, he could, he could be seen only in the fact that he was a remarkably thoughtful and quiet child, with the restraint and behavior unusual in boys his age. Eugene, quote, Eugene was a serious, studious boy from early childhood, his mother said. He was extraordinarily intelligent. His natural genius was first noticed in his ability to grasp things right away, before children of his own age and sometimes before adults. One of his elementary school teachers once said of him, 
quote, I feel hurried when he walks into the room. I feel that I have to get right down to business so as to not waste his time, end quote. Eugene's reserved and studious nature, however, did not keep him from participating in some of the usual pastimes of American boys, such as playing cowboys and keeping a chart of baseball scores. He became a member of the Cub Scouts, where his den mother happened to be the mother of actor Gregory Peck. When he was six years old, he began taking piano lessons, which he continued in college. Between the ages of 10 and 12, he was a traffic patrol officer at his elementary school, a duty which his mother remembered him taking very seriously. Upon graduating from the school, he was given an honorable discharge with the rank of sergeant, just as his father had from the army. Eugene had a great love for nature. During all three summers of his junior high school years, he attended courses in zoology at the Junior Summer School of Science, sponsored by the San Diego Zoo of Natural History. As part of the courses, he was able to study animals firsthand at the famous San Diego Zoo. Living near the ocean, he had a special interest in marine life and kept preserved octopuses and other sea creatures in his closet. He also had his small butterfly collection. A fascination with the night sky inspired him to paint his bedroom ceiling with stars, all in their proper places. Here's a picture of a uh, little cowboy, Eugene. On Friday evenings, he and his father would walk together to the neighborhood library. This was a weekly ritual their night out. Eugene would come home loaded with books. During summers, he took part in the library's, quote, vacation reading club, end quote. Eugene began reading the works of Charles Dickens at a young age. He especially loved the Pickwick Papers, the book that had once brought Dickens overnight fame. His mother later remembered him laughing aloud while reading it. When it came time for him to go to sleep, she would barge into his room and turn off the light. Later, she would be awakened at the sound of giggling. Returning to her son's room to see what was going on, she would discover him under the blankets with a flashlight continuing to read the book. Eugene had a little dog named Ditto. Ditto was not too smart, but it was Eugene's own creature, and he had exceptional love for it. He would thoughtfully look into its eyes. When Ditto was run over by a car, Eugene cried inconsolably. This was the first encounter with death. Others thought his reaction was exaggerated. Someone said, quote, it's unnatural to love a dog like that. A dog, end quote. Together with this uncommonly loving nature, the young Eugene had a strong religious inclinations. His mother, a church-going Protestant Christian, was the one to encourage his interest. His father had dropped out of the Catholic Church at age 18. No one talked about this, and no one knew why. Although Frank Rose was not like his father in being anti-religious, Frank was not anti-anything for that matter, he never showed any incentive to go to church. In later years, he attended a Protestant church, but according to Esther, this was only to please her. Quote, as children, Aileen remembers, we went with mother to various Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches, where mother always sang in the choir. We usually changed churches because she had some disagreement with the minister. As a young boy, Eugene went to a Bible class as a Presbyterian church near his home. He often surprised his parents with his knowledge of the scriptures, which he quoted to, the, to them from memory. According to his mother, the Old Testament books of Esther and Samuel left a deep impression on him. When he was in the eighth grade, he went entirely on his own initiative to be baptized and confirmed as a Christian in a Methodist church. In high school, Eugene ceased to pursue an interest in religion. Eugene was not religious at all, recalls his best friend from that period, Walter Pomatroy. To compensate for this lack of religion, he zealously sought knowledge in science and mathematics, biology, algebra, trigonometry, etc. Quote, we went to high school at a time when science was expected to save the world, end quote, Walter explains. Quote, most of the people who were preparing for college were planning to become scientists, physicists, engineers, or medical doctors, end quote. San Diego High was an ethnically diverse school, with the majority of its students coming from families on a lower middle class income. The college prep students formed a relatively small percentage of the student body. These intellectual achievers were in the same clubs and took the same courses in the pre-college curriculum together, but within their ranks was a clear, uh, clear social division. The main group of them, by far the larger, was composed of the students from wealthy families from the good part of town. The smaller group was composed of six or seven boys from middle to lower class families, three of whom were Jewish and one of whom was Mexican descent. Eugene and Walter belonged to the latter group. 
the members of the wealthy group were active in student government, seeking election as class officers, and made up the membership of the school's social clubs of the pre-fraternity sorority type. Although they were friendly to other students, after all, says Walter, you were a vote, they generally kept their own company. They were the social elite of the campus. The smaller group was united by a common interest in music, literature, and art. During lunch breaks, the boys would discuss books they had read or the works of classical music they loved. They never listened to the pop music of their era. Quote, we were hardly aware of such things existed, Walter recalls. Quote. Although Eugene had some of the others had athletic ability and received A's in gym class, they did not try out for sports teams, says Walter. Quote, we were what today would be called the nerds, end quote. The students in Eugene's group were very well read and culturally advanced for their age. Walter felt privileged to be part of the group and to learn from it, since he had been exposed to relatively little culture prior to high school. The Jewish boys had been raised on classical music and had, uh, and had some strong opinions on the subject. They especially praised Mozart, Beethoven, and Brahms, but had no use for the modern composers. Walter, on the other hand, preferred the moderns and so would enter the, into a debate with the others on a relative worth of, for example, Debussy and Brahms. Where did Eugene stand in these discussions? Quote, he was more attracted to the distinctly classical than the modern composers, Walter says, but he listened to everything and gave it all a chance. He was slow to pass judgment, end quote. Here are some pictures. Uh, Eugene on the left here, uh, classmates at San Diego High. Next to that picture, you have Eugene beside a school bus on an outing to Elmont Park, November 5, 1951. On the bottom there, you have Eugene, second from right, with friends, El with friends at El Monte Park, November 1951. Then on the top right, of the top page, uh, Eugene, right on the right during high school gym class, and then Eugene from left, uh, a picture there with his friends on the bottom. Eugene's favorite piece of music at that time was an uh, was an aria of of the last act of Puccini's Tosca in which the hero, about to be executed, writes a letter to his beloved, beginning the words, quote, and the stars were shining, end quote. Eugene especially liked the recording of his aria song by Ferrucci Tagliavini. Quote, we listened, we listened to it many times, Walter says, and rhapsodized about how great we thought it was, end quote. When the group of friends argued over intellectual matters, Eugene was not wont to express his own opinion. Quote, mostly he would examine things, Walter says, and if you made a blunder in your argument, he'd be quick to show it. The most quiet and introspective among us, he was more likely to be a commentator than an agitator, end quote. Eugene studied intensely in high school, quote, burning the midnight oil, as his mother said. Once Esther told him, quote, at, that, at the rare you're studying, at the rate you're studying, you'll be a very smart man someday, end quote. I don't want to be smart, he said. I want to be wise. Quote, with his, with his native intelligence, Eugene could be, have received B's without doing anything, Walter attests, but he worked harder than anyone I ever knew. He was so incredibly thorough in everything he put his hands on. When we were assigned a science report, he would, call, oh, he would cover all the ends of the subject. He had an analytical way of looking at things. His slowness in passing judgment was especially helpful in chemistry because he would carefully look at all the parts of an experiment before forming conclusions. In the word of Eugene's nephew, Mike Scott, who was only seven years his junior, quote, Eugene was phenomenal academically. He was off the scale, end quote. Sometimes his class marks were so high above the other students that they had to be given the only A, that he'd be given the only A. At the same time, however, he continued to exhibit the qualities of his father. His mother recalled him saying, quote, don't let anyone think you're important, end quote. Sally Scott, Eugene's niece, remembers the following about him. Quote, he was always Uncle Jeannie to me. He was quiet and very much the scholar. He was ever the teacher, ever patient, and even as a youth had a certain inner composure which set him apart. As a boy, that difference may have caused him some grief until he found his true home. I remember one incident that involved books. At family dinners on holidays, Jean would join the group for dinner and, re and retire to his room and studies immediately after. I have a love of books myself, and one day he found me in his room reading his books. I was perhaps nine or ten years old and had been frightened of being caught. He asked me which books I liked best. There were two, A Dog Named Chips and Charlie by Albert Pison Tarun. He then presented a challenge. 
If I could memorize the titles and authors' full name by my next visit, the books would be mine to keep. I read them many times over the years and have read them to my daughters. I still have the books, end quote. Together with Walter, Eugene was a member of the high school German club, chemistry club, and chess club. In the German club, German class, he was only uh, he was called by the German version of his name, Eugene, pronounced Eugen. Walter began to for, uh, refer to Eugene in this way outside of class, associating the sound of Eugen with the name of the famous Russian narrative poem by Pushkin and the opera by Tchaikovsky, Eugene Eugen. Eugene was to carry his nickname beyond his school years. When writing to friends in college, he would sign his name Eugen and occasionally use the translated term Oigen, O-I-G-N, end quote. In high school, Eugene demonstrated a remarkable facility in languages, learning not only German, but also French and Spanish. By the time he graduated, he was writing original poems in German. He also excelled in mathematics, which Walter attributes to the fact that his discipline, in addition to requiring an analytical mind, involves a great deal of introspection. Eugene's math teacher hoped he would pursue a career in this field and championed him as a student worthy of receiving college scholarships. Eugene's English teacher, Mr. Baskerville, also took an interest in him and his future. According to Walter Barkersville, uh, Baskerville encouraged a free, artistic lifestyle. He enjoyed music and had great love for Spanish romantic poetry. Among other things, he introduced Eugene to the American nature of Robinson Jeffers, a man who protested against society and its wars at a time when it was very unfashionable to do so. Eugene had no time for trivia, his mother said. The senseless diversions of high school students, as well as the pomp of high school ceremonies, were a source of absolute boredom to him. Mike Scott remembers being amazed that Eugene had no desire to learn to, dr no desire to, learn to drive let alone own a car, at a time when great peer pressure was attached to having a driver's license. Eugene felt that even his friend Walter was not serious enough and objected to his carousing and running around at night, quote, like a butterfly, end quote. When it came time for the high school graduation exercise and celebrations with all the proud parents in pit pageantry, Eugene did, Eugene did not want to be bothered with the standard renting of a tuxedo. Eugene did, however, take part in the production of a school play that was performed during the commencement. Although with 12, 12 other students under the supervision of a teacher, he helped to write the play, acted in it, and was in charge of the tickets. The play, entitled, quote, Grown a Little Taller, end quote, was written with the aim of pleasing the students' parents and relatives who comprised the audience. Expressing the American dream, this was all per uh, this was all still prevalently in the 1950s. It upheld the ideals of family and religion with reason, economic and career advancement, responsibility and hard work together with humanitarian service and the spirit of Albert Schweitzer. Eugene graduated from San Diego High School in June of 1952. He was ranked at the top of his class. In his high school yearbook, his fellow students wrote notes, notes such as Eugene the Genius, Lots of luck and don't give up Einstein too much. Don't give Einstein too much competition. He received a number of scholarships, the large being the $4,000 George F. Baker scholarship, which he was given thanks to his enthusiastic endorsement of his math teacher. When he received this award, he did not make a big show of it. His mother, having found out about the award, elatedly asked him, where's the letter? In the drawer, he replied calmly, remembering this and similar incidents, his mother once said of him, quote, I never saw such a modest boy, end quote. He even returned the smaller scholarships he received, explaining this by saying, I've had enough. At the time, Eugene had no definite ideas about a future career, no plans beyond a decision to enter Pomona College in Southern California. His math teacher was later disappointed when Eugene did not major in mathematics. Quote, Eugene could have, been succeed, could have succeeded at anything, Walter says, but he did not have anything to pour himself into. He needed something to be passionate about, end quote. San Diego was filled with canyons, parts of which were overgrown with trees, brush, and grasses. Near the Roses, modest suburban home was one such ravine, locally called Juniper Canyon. Through this canyon, Eugene often took long walks alone studying nature, or when he went at night, gazing up into the starry realm above the trees. What he thought about during these hours of solitude is unknown. Judging from the turns his life would soon take, however, it could be that these long walks were bound up not only with thinking, but also with traces of suffering. Father Paul Florensky, the great 
Russian scientist and martyr once said, quote, the fate of greatness is suffering from the external world and inward suffering that comes from oneself. So it was, so it is, and so it shall be, end quote. Eugene was soon to enter into the unnamed inward suffering, which was the consequence of his being set apart from the world around him. Since his mind enabled him to understand things far ahead of others, he was plunged, he was plagued with boredom with the common things that had already experienced and understood. He had a longing for more. He wanted to go on, but where? But to where? There was on him this that stamp of nobility which made him incapable of finding fulfillment in lower material things, the things of this earth. Quote, Eugene had deep eyes, Walter recalls. You didn't want to look into them because they would burn into you. It was as if he was attempting to see into the heart of the matter always. He always seemed to me like a tea kettle that was about to blow out steam. You knew something was boiling in there. You waited for him to blow his stack, but he never did. He was always calm, observing things, waiting to do something with what he was soaking up. End quote. Eugene had become a thinker, a lover of wisdom, who required an answer to the question why. And whatever that answer was, he had to experience and live it. This much he knew, or rather felt, even then. And it was this which would determine the course of his life, life up until his death. Thanks for listening.